time for us to start our readings. Our first reader is the lovely and brilliant and fabulously talented Rebecca Strop, who's so talented that after this, she goes and takes up her other job as a professional mixologist at Yield Watering Hole. So let's hear it for Rebecca Strop and her story. Lunacy. Thank you. <laughs> Lunacy. That night I climbed through the trap door in the ceiling up onto the roof. This was difficult to manage without making a great deal of noise, and I sat for quite some time listening to make sure I had not awakened Joe before hoisting myself through. The air was almost cold in the moonlight, but the tar roof was still hot with sun. I stood a while feeling heat and cool, smelling tar and concrete and stone, trash and urine and trees and flesh, while gazing into the near dis distance. I felt myself to be where I knew myself to be, on the rooftop above a spare room in my apartment, above another apartment and another, heavy with plaster and wood and stone on the concrete of Passyunk Avenue in the middle of Philadelphia, with the Delaware to the east and the Schuylkill to the west. I felt New Jersey and the Atlantic Ocean. I felt Delaware and New York and western Pennsylvania. I felt soles of feet on rooftop. I felt muscles. I felt the balance and gravity of hips, breasts, the suspension of heart and beats, slender neck and impossibly heavy head full of synapses, full of electricity. Having located myself on my foundation, I turned to face the sky. I looked at the sun's reflection in the moon and felt the memory of him blazing in the soles of my feet. There are no stars in Philadelphia. It is not necessary for me to see them. I know they're there. I know what a proper view of outer space should look like, so I feel myself in orbit. I feel the distance between the planets until I imagine the galaxy flat and swirling and crowded and coldly, suspiciously still. I feel myself in the universe. I feel it echo in my cells. The spaces between electrons stretching out for light years. I feel infinite, no end to the space out there or in here. Everything going on forever in either direction, larger and larger and smaller and smaller and curiouser and curiouser. I feel myself a point on a Mobius strip. I know myself to blink in and out of existence, disappearing and reappearing all along the twisted ellipse like a particle of light. I need no metaphors to describe this. It is exact. Having located myself in the time-space continuum and contemplated quantum physics as thoroughly as I am able, I return to subjective and subjunctive existence where clocks are relevant. I stretched and looked around at the rooftops and watched skyscrapers do as they promise. Hi! The shout startled and appalled me. I winced, hunched my shoulders, and, squint and squinted as though in pain. Didn't this maniac know that people were trying to sleep? People like my husband, who would likely have me committed if he found me standing on the roof at 3 a.m. I spun round to find the jackass making the ruckus. He was standing on the rooftop across the alley. He was tall and broad, dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. He stood facing me with his hands in his pockets, feet shoulder-width apart, close to the edge of the building and directly across from me, as though he was trying to get a, as close to conversation range as possible without actually jumping off the building. He showed no outward sign of mental deficiency or mania. I had rather been expecting a wild-eyed and haired derelict wearing slippers and fresh urine. I stood frozen in my pose of bemused incredulity. He smiled and waved casually. Hi! Shh! I screamed. What the hell do you think you're doing? Do you know what time it is? My husband has a shotgun, I stage whispered. What? I said my husband has a shotgun and will use it on one or both of us if you wake him up. He smiled and nodded in enthusiastic politeness as though I had made a joke he didn't quite get. It's a beautiful night. What are you, retarded? Shut the fuck up. I waved my arms in a melodramatic interpretive pantomime of shutting the fuck up. He had leaned forward attentively, head cocked with one ear in my direction to catch my contribution to the conversation. Now he leaned back, looking thoughtful. He turned slowly to contemplate the sky. I began to relax and lowered my arms as my breathing returned to normal. Wiping sweat from my brow and shaking my head, I turned to go. Does the moon look closer to you? I let out an involuntary scream and covered my ears. I say, does the moon look bigger to you, like it's getting closer? I was speechless. Clearly, I needed to just go back inside and hope I made it to bed before Joe was awakened by this nut job. I turned around with the intention of taking a running dive through the trap door and stopped short, for there was the moon, 
hovering low over Liberty One so that the skyscraper's spire seemed to tickle the moon's belly. I tried to assimilate this picture. I tried to reconcile this with my knowledge of my location on the time-space continuum. Sometimes the moon looks really big when it gets down near the horizon like that, I shouted. Yes, but that doesn't just look big, he replied. It, it looks closer. I knew what he meant. Craters and mountains on the moon's surface were no longer shadows to be mistaken for a man's face or a Native American woman. They were visible as peaks and valleys, just like looking through a telescope, except nothing else had come any closer. Crazy kind of optical illusion, isn't it? Denial seemed the best course of action. Crazy, he agreed. Wow, there are a lot of stars. I've never seen so many. He was right. The Milky Way fl flowed through a field of sparkling orbs as big as lanterns. I looked around to see if the city had had a power outage, but streetlights and buildings glowed stoically as ever. Clear night, I said. Gosh, I guess, he said. And we were both silent for a while. I stood stock still, watching intently to see if I could detect any motion in the sky. I didn't want to blink for feel that, fear that when I opened my eyes, the moon would be impaled on Billy Penn atop City Hall, and the stars would be advancing in a stately procession down Broad Street. I got the impression that my companion across the alley was surprised at this phenomenon, but no more so than he would have been if he had read that a dog and a cat had managed to produce offspring, or if the weather had been unseasonably warm. I looked over to see if I could gauge his expression from this distance, and I could. He had turned again to, to face me and was looking at me with an expression of awe I deemed appropriate for the occasion. Perhaps he was not completely mad. I turned back to the moon. You know, I said, they say the world is going to end in 2012. Well, wouldn't it be funny if what actually happened was, well, you know how they say the universe is expanding? Well, wouldn't it be funny if in 2012 everything came to a screeching halt and reversed? Like if the way the world ended was just that it got put back together with the rest of the stuff that exploded out from the Big Bang? Pulled back in like a yo-yo. I love you, he said. Pardon, I said. What? I said, what? I love you. All this is for you. Besides, if the world did end that way, we'd never know it. I think the universe is part of us, like we're part of it. And our cells are part of us, and we're all expanding or contracting at the same rate. You know? As he was speaking, I realized there was no alley separating the rooftops anymore. I know! I mean, I know. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. We're doing this once a month, every month. I need it. I need it.